to Coyote Ugly, the satellite bar, where you get a little in-depth look into the world of Coyote Ugly from behind the bar. And today, I am hosting a special segment of this. I am Lee Killingsworth, the Chief Marketing Officer for Coyote Ugly Saloon. Been working for the company since 2002. Um, and I am here with the Coyote of the Internet, Courtney Carter. <laughs> <laughs> And today we're turning the tables on her. And instead of interviewing other people, she's the one that's getting interviewed today. How do you feel about that, Courtney? I'm excited. I'm excited. A little nervous, but excited. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be nervous. This is just going to come like a, a, cam a casual conversation that you're just having with an old friend. And this did story did start between you and I a very long time ago. <laughs> very long time ago. So that's where I want to start this. Where, how did this story start for you? Like, talk to us about the background of you starting with Coyote Ugly and what year it was and where that was. Ooh, so I was in Charlotte and I was actually working as a Hooters girl, found out that they were opening the Coyote Ugly in downtown Charlotte and I had missed the actual, actual tryouts. So I like go down there and ask the owner or the manager, I guess the GM, um, are you guys still doing tryouts? Like, I love to dance. I feel like I would be awesome. Just give me a chance. Never bartended before, but if you just give me a chance, you, I promise you won't regret it. And she took a chance on me and I was there, you know, trying out, doing our boot camp, learning the dance routines and open that bar on opening night. So that Charlotte bar, what year was that that would, that, that opened? That was 2004. Yeah, so we, I was busy. I would think I was either opening Austin or San Antonio across the country at that time. And, and Charlotte was one of the original franchise deals that came out of the movie, right off the movie. So that was a franchise that was owned from the Atlanta group that actually mm -hmm. had that as part of their second team. There's their second location. Um, and how long did you work at that Charlotte location? I was there for about a year, year and a half, and then I went to the Atlanta bar and then came back to the Charlotte one after like a couple of months that I was in Atlanta, maybe close to a year. Yeah. So you only were in Atlanta for a little while? Yes, only for a little bit. Was in a like crazy living situation there and ended up coming back to Charlotte and right fell back right at home with my Charlotte Coyote family. Oh my God. So you were <laughs> there in Atlanta when Buckhead still existed. Yes. yes. And for those of you that don't know what Buckhead is, Buckhead was one of the most insane entertainment districts in the country at Absolutely. this time. Absolutely. It was super hot. And now it's nothing compared to what it was. <laughs> I haven't uh, been back down there, but I've been hearing like some really bad stories that it's definitely not the Buckhead that I worked in. No, so what ended up, the whole place ended up getting kind of redone. So, mm -hmm. and this happens a lot in a lot of different districts. So when you're a city planner and you've got a downtown district that maybe was a warehouse district, typically was a warehouse district, that manufacturing has left now these warehouses that are in prime downtown areas are just sitting there and crime and homelessness, like a lot of other issues come with having empty buildings. And they would sit there and look at a place like that. And what they do is they encourage our industry, the bar, restaurant, hospitality industry to go to these areas and develop them. And they set up very attractive deals, whether it's, you know, um, grant money or just ease of licensing or extended period licensing um, they use to kind of attract developers to come to these areas. And these club and restaurant people will do the work and they build out these great neighborhoods and then they get really popular and then something can happen. <laughs> and in the case of Buckhead, there was a really bad shootout between P Diddy's security team and um, some people coming out of a club. I believe at the end of that, there was over 50 shell casings found at the exchange of this, but that kind of marked a moment that that kind of shifted for Buckhead. So, and that happens in a lot of districts. I've seen that across play out across the country. So, 
when Buck had disappeared, most of the bars all disappeared. Mm -hmm. um, most of the bars, the nightclubs, the restaurants. Now it's uh, mixed use, high development, condominiums and stuff like that, which is typically what follows the nightclub yeah. district. Right now you <laughs> yeah. can see this underway, live, happening in Charleston, North Carolina, or South mm -hmm. Carolina, Charleston, okay. North South Carolina. They have a really cool downtown district. They've got an entertainment district where it's walking traffic only. They aren't issuing any more licenses that go past 12 a.m. So they do that designed to keep the nightclub people out of it. They still keep the restaurants. Mm -hmm. They'll eventually make it even more difficult for restaurants and it'll end up just being the, the mixed use condos and, and some retail. But what, because the reason that happens is that the residents that first like coming into a downtown district where it's loud and exciting, uh -huh. get older, the kids, that loud <laughs> night no longer are great. And it yeah. just shifts the, the, the culture of the area. Mm. So it's not it's like, a, like a bad thing or a good thing. It's just, a, that's just how it works. So from our perspective, it's rough because you lose locations like the Atlanta bar that was a great location. but when the whole district kind of falls apart, everyone skedaddles. And they, they encourage that a lot. They bought a lot of places out so they could redo them as, as mixed use condos and stuff like that. So we met first because during this period, I believe you were selected for some thing what I, was that exactly i was i was in the first mm -hmm. calendar that's right <laughs> yes so you were in our first ever calendar and that was shot by an amazing photographer named clay enos and i hopefully i'm saying that name right but he's uh, actually a very famous new york photographer i don't know if you saw the suicide squad yes that movie that came out with jared leto that um movie had a photo shoot with Jared Leto as the Joker. He did some of the promo uh, promotional photography for the first original Suicide Squad and he shot Jared Leto which I'm probably showing right now um <laughs> in this really cool photo shoot and I I love seeing the success that he continues to have and it's just really cool like he was the one that shot our first calendar and I and Lil knew him somehow I'm not really sure that New York bar just has a lot of uh, fun guests over the years. I bet. <laughs> that, that, I still follow fair, him that. and his assistant, and they are just so awesome. So right? awesome. So I still use a lot of that photo shoot, too. Um, like, it, it still pops up over over time. It wasn't that, that, that calendar photo shoot, but we did extra shots around that. And, mm -hmm. and you have one of the most iconic shots for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, from Thank that you. photo shoot and, and it gets used quite a bit that I love moving beyond that. So what happened to you post Coyote Ugly? Cause there, you worked there for how long? Like for our company for how long? Until 2007. So about three years altogether. Um, and then so you started I left flying I'm... high or something. If I remember correctly, yes, right? I became a flight attendant. Yep. I left yes. to become a flight attendant. So. You saw, did you do any traveling for Coyote at that point? Because you're at a franchise bar, so probably didn't have as many opportunities for that. But Yes. Yeah, no traveling okay. for Coyote besides so, the calendar. The, the calendar. So you got to come visit us, I believe, in Texas when we mm -hmm. shot the first one. I think we were supposed to shoot that calendar in, like, New Orleans and, like, Hurricane Katrina was around that time or something. That's exactly what happened. Okay. Um, it was going to be in New Orleans. And then Hurricane Katrina happened and we couldn't do that. So we quickly moved it to our San Antonio location and shot it there. And that worked out pretty good because that's a two-story location. Mm -hmm. and we had that upstairs that we could utilize as a studio. And then we shot, yours actually was downstairs. You had the, the wall of barrels, barrels, if I remember. Yep. Right? So here's that picture right here, looking yeah. fabulous. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And that, that did take a minute to set up, if I remember correctly. Yeah. We don't do those kinds of shoots anymore. We stopped doing it that way. Um, we only did a couple calendars in the bars, actually. Oh, then it I shifted loved to it. a bikini calendar. Yeah. So it did. You were one of the few ones that actually were genuinely shot in the bar. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. We were special. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I still keep in touch with a lot of those calendar girls. And 
We really, yeah. we took San Antonio by storm. We tore it up. <laughs> oh, yes. In total coyote fashion. The river yes. walk had no idea what was going on. Sure. Yes. We actually shot there again. Um, probably was 2018, 2017, 2017, I think. My God. And we shot it out on location around the river walk this time. Ooh. I changed my T-shirt six times that day, I think. <laughs> Because it was just like I had just come out of a pool. I believe it. I it believe it. Dead summer, Texas, right on that river walk, man. It was just really humidity was killing you. We're <laughs> humping equipment back and forth. Uh, one of the boat drivers ended up kind of crashing a little <laughs> bit into the side uh, because he was doing the stare look thing. <laughs> mm. So it was, it was pretty funny, actually. Uh, that picture I'm going to show right here is this one. When that happened, I might, <laughs> hopefully I have some B-roll of that actual guy because I think I did take some pictures. I'm obviously. sure you do, Lee. You have yeah. everything. All right. So who was Courtney when she started Coyote? Who was Courtney <laughs> when she started becoming a, a airline a flight attendant? Ooh, Courtney before Coyote. I definitely had confidence, but... um. It's something different that Coyote Ugly brings out of us coyotes. Mm -hmm. Like, it just gives you, like, it empowers us. Like, I had confidence, but wasn't certain of my ability to, to run shit, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. And being because in the that, girls run the floor. Yeah, right? yeah. And being in that we, position where what I yeah. say goes, if I tell a BMF, like, he's touching me or get him out or, you know, what I say goes. And I had control yeah. over the situation. And that was very empowering to me. Oh. And the relationships that I made. Yeah, the camaraderie behind the the most difficult bartending gig I've ever seen, for sure. You know what I mean? I know we're biased, but I would really say that that's the most difficult. A I, performance I, I bartender. I bartended from busy nightclubs in Las Vegas to dirty college bars to high-end restaurants and everything in between. <laughs> this is I was a flair bartender. I competed in this contest right my right at the end of my bartending career, which was also a very short one because it was it was fun. But I needed a little bit more of a of an, a challenge, I guess you could say, because yeah. I did get to the point where I was competing against some of the best bartenders in the world after only bartending for a, a few years and. As exciting that was, it was really because I got to work with guys like Ken Hall from The Rio, who worked at the Voodoo Lounge, which was like the premier flair place in the world. Mm -hmm. And being able to do some yard dates with guys like him or then becoming friends with guys like Dean Cerniels, who was the inventor of the flair bottle, who also I had go do the, the instruction in the reality show we did with MTV Networks. Okay. Where they were teaching the girls flair. And I believe that was the second season, I think, where we paired up a veteran girl with a newbie to see uh -huh. who could win at the end of the season. Um, and he, he, he took on the responsibility of training the girls because if you look at the first episode, the first season mm -hmm. of the pilot episode, you're going to see me and Kevin right here trying to teach <laughs> the girls flair. And that was a mixed bag experience so i thought we should just leave it to the professionals and that's why we brought in dean uh but but yeah it's hands down the hardest bartending gig i've ever seen you've got to be a fast bartender you've got to know uh you've got to know your liquors even though we don't make the full range of drinks and cocktails that a lot of other places will mm -hmm. because it goes back to lil being a bartender and having to work at places yeah. that had a blender that just like every other bartender, she couldn't stand yes. dealing with blended drinks. That's why we have no blenders and have never had one I love at that. any Coyote ever. Yeah. That was the hardest, one of the biggest shifts for me coming from the Vegas club world to Coyote Ugly. I came from uh, the venue, like the venue now, Tao, the, mm -hmm. the place, the amazing place in Vegas, uh -huh. highest grossing restaurant ever in history. Which is, it's really a nightclub, though, let's be fair. But um, they they had the same space I had before it. So I worked there. It was a place called the Velvet Lounge. And it was owned partially by Warner Brothers. But the team behind it was the same team that did Planet Hollywood. 
Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So this was the next upscale version of a Planet Hollywood, and they partnered with Warner Brothers on it. And it, I don't, I'm going to try to find some pictures online. This is going back to 99 <laughs> to 2002 when it closed. <laughs> so this is pre-internet. So it's going to be, we'll see what I find. Okay. <laughs> but, but it was an amazing venue that was 65,000 square feet. They had upstairs and downstairs. The nightclub aspect was what I dealt with upstairs. Um, but the full restaurant downstairs had four big rooms that de designed like the 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 movies of the original Batman. And the guy that did the original set design on that movie mm -hmm. came in and did the restaurant. Oh, wow. Casablanca, the same guy that did the set for that, did the set in the, our movie or on our restaurant. And then also Ocean's Eleven. This was pre- the remake. Uh -huh. So they were they were ahead of the curve on that one. Um, and it was like this gorgeous room with white leather. It looked very, very high end, 19, early 50s, like Miami. Just think like That's white what leather. I was ever. Thinking. <laughs> yeah, it was really, really, it was gorgeous, actually. I came from that world where I was creating martinis that I got into vanity fair covering them right mm -hmm. and i go to coyote ugly where they will fire you for making a lemon drop <laughs> right like you don't make that drink and it's it's just the concept that was like mind-blowing to me like to get my head around that because i just couldn't imagine saying no to a customer about something that's such a popular drink right? right but what i didn't quite understand at that time which i get very much now is that Nightlife and bars and clubs are really about creating their own universe, mm -hmm. right? When you cross that door, that threshold into that place, you are no longer in the real world anymore. Right. Now you're in this other world where light and music and smells and textures are all being used to evoke specific emotional responses in people that are there. Mm -hmm. Everything from the way the line is done to VIP, to the drinks, to the menus, yeah. to the type of music you're programming, determine what that universe is. And in the Coyote Ugly universe, it is about getting down, <clears throat> having fun, and just what Lil would call real drinkers, right? Mm -hmm. Like ones that don't do all those those fruit fruity things that I love. <laughs> right. and, and so does she. But when we create, when she created Coyote Ugly, like that was not the, the the universe she wanted. Right. She created a rebel bar that did everything differently than everybody else. Right. She right. was playing a country western jukebox in 1993 in the middle of New York the height of the punk scene, right? Mm -hmm. Like what's more punk rock than, than that? Like putting on some of these classic country tunes in a complete dive bar. And then, you know, with the whole aspect of jumping up on the bar, which was just like a style of bartending that she developed on her own working across the street at the Village Idiot, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it became this thing that changed an industry. Yeah. and created this community of bartenders like yourself yep. That, yep. that still come to the anniversary parties, right? <laughs> that still talk about this experience. And I think everybody has a job in their, their life like that. Mm -hmm. It was like the job that was different than every other job. Absolutely. For a lot of people, Coyote Ugly is that job. Yes, yes. And I love being part of that story of being part of all the other stories of the people that come into our bars where they're celebrating their victories, a merger, mm -hmm. a, a celebration for a birthday or an anniversary, or they're getting engaged. Like there's just a million things that on the course of an average night that when you're in this industry that you get to be part of. Absolutely. Right? Yes. That, that to me is the secret sauce. That's what I love about yeah. this industry. And what I love about this brand is how it gave an opportunity to women to kind of show, hey, 2,000 years of men running the show at these bars, like it doesn't have to be that way. And she put a bunch of women behind that bar. And I was in Vegas at the time when the movie came out. Mm -hmm. And when that movie came out, it changed the back bar of every place in Las Vegas. It went from 
almost all male bartenders with a female bartender, which is what I was working in that scenario at the mm -hmm. last place I worked at, mm -hmm. to now it's almost all women bartenders and maybe a guy or two sprinkled in. That's um, true. It, it, it had reverberations throughout the industry. And I, I can't exactly pinpoint why that maybe happened, but it, it clearly was a moment that for 2000 years, the bar industry has existed and it's predominantly been run by men. And then here comes this plucky little New York, five foot nothing, <laughs> uh, Wall Street dropout <laughs> who ended up going this crazy bar route and, and got worldwide success. And now is a billion dollar brand yeah. with locations in 10 different countries. We had a, a huge reality show on MTV where 51 million people watched that pilot episode. Yeah, I was one of and, them. <laughs> and the story continues. Like here, we just celebrated 30 years in New York, right? You remember that? Yeah. The nation's oldest newspaper. I can't tell you for sure if that's true, but this what this that's what they newspaper say. Newspaper say. <laughs> they say they are. Put us on the cover of the Sunday edition celebrating our 30th bar anniversary since the first one opened, right? Okay. And to me, like journalists don't care about corporate milestones. Mm -hmm. There's just something different about the story of Coyote Ugly that people love, which is why that G GQ article written by Elizabeth Gilbert, who went on to her own huge fame, mm -hmm. caught the eye of Jerry Bruckheimer. And that's how the movie came about because that story is interesting and Lil is interesting. She's interesting because when she had an idea she was laser focused on it and, and she wanted to create a, a, a universe that didn't exist at that moment. And by doing that, change an industry yep. and change like thousands of women across the globe yeah. as well. Yeah. Because that's the one thing I hear from all of the former coyotes like yourself is like how different they are now compared to who they were walking in the first time. Absolutely. I truly right. believe that I am the badass that I am because of my experience at Coyote Ugly. Because you are. You <laughs> yes. are. Yes. How many countries did you get to go to as a flight attendant? I was um, on flew for a regional carrier, so I didn't fly to any other countries, ah. just across the U.S. Yeah. And what's really sad is that, you know, I had all those flying benefits, and at the time, yeah. like, I felt like none of my friends really wanted to fly anywhere. That's, all just... <laughs> that's the problem I faced for the last 20 years myself. Like I traveled the world, almost all of it by myself. <laughs> yeah. Cause no, they don't, they didn't want to do anything. I'm like, you guys are crazy. I have these flying benefits and everyone yeah. was just fine with hanging out in Charlotte and partying on college street. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. I know. And that was my experience, too. I didn't have friends that could just pick up and be like, hey, come meet me in Costa Rica. Come meet me in uh, Aruba. You right. know, I, I've been to 28 countries, 400 cities worldwide um, over the last 20 plus years doing market research for this company or, you know, we're opening so you're locations. You're like 20 years old. How did you do that? Yeah, this gray <laughs> disagrees with you. Oh, my God. No, I was still in my 20s when we started this little adventure, though. That is nope. some story. I'm sure but there's a this, lot of details that you did not share that, that I really do want to know. <laughs> oh, of course there is. And that's what the whole purpose of this podcast, this channel, this Instagram page is about. is about talking about these stories that we've never shared with anyone. Right. We haven't told anybody about any of this stuff. And we've got another upcoming podcast that I'm doing with Liliana Lovell herself, the founder of Coyote Ooh. Ugly who has been a little bit absent <laughs> over the last couple of years because our last endeavor was something we called the Lil Spill on our website, mm -hmm. which is a blog. It was a blog. And that blog gave people a bigger insight into Lil in little snippets, right? In little posts. At, at first, it was mostly bitching about me, uh, if I'm being 100% <laughs> honest. But that became so popular that it caught network executive studio heads attention. And that's how the reality show came about because they got that, that little more look into this fascinating person that's Lil. Yeah. We're now taking that to the next level with this podcast where we're basically going to talk about some of these crazy stories over the years that we've had to deal with, like opening in Russia, mm -hmm. having a bar in Kiev 
during a civil war, <laughs> you know, opening in Japan and, and what came along with that. All of these amazing stories that we've never told anybody. Yeah. So so strap in. And and for her, she really wanted to focus on one aspect of this this adventure. And that aspect is doing this industry, generating a billion sales, doing international business, and then dipping our fingers into all these different industries. It's stressful. <laughs> it causes a lot of stress. So there's a whole side adventure that has happened alongside of opening all these bars everywhere. And what that side adventure is, is the life balance stuff we have been throwing in to all of these openings and, and these business stuff to help mitigate that stress. Mm -hmm. And for Lil, it has been a very much an, an adventure within the marathon and scuba worlds, mm -hmm. right? For me, it's been a lot of other things like from photography to martial arts to world travel. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten into doing marathons. Lil's done um, uh, an insane 120 mile trek through the Himalayan mountains. I did with Kevin Bailey, a motorcycle race from Key West to Alaska, where you had to sleep by your motorcycle the whole time. And people were getting shot at because the prize money was a Hot five hundred thousand dollars. Oh my so it gosh! A thousand global riders to this one contest, and it was a little nuts. So we're going to talk about all this stuff that we've done over the years to kind of help mitigate stress. Yeah. And what we have you doing is giving people a look into what's going on behind the bars, right? Mm -hmm. Who is the coyote of the month? Which you know we featured on our website, but now you're actually talking to them. And maybe you're not from Denver, but you're going to feel like you have a friend in Denver. Before right. You even got it, right. So, so that's why, you know, we are in its infancy right now where we are getting our feelers. We're trying to figure this out. Eventually I'm hoping we'll be working in the same studio. Um, at least, you know, at, at least virtually of some kind, but we'll figure this out. At least we're both in North, North Carolina. Yeah. That's so one, we're, we're one step closer. We're at least in one state <laughs> yes. right now. So, yes. so that helps. Yeah. But yeah, so that's, that's what we've wanted to do. And being able to bring you on as back into the family, yeah. which you've never left, but you, you know, you, you get less active and now, now you got your boots back in. Yes. Right? Your boots back <laughs> into the, the coyote satellite bar, which is, it is going to be a lot of fun. You know what I mean? Because once everything starts ramping up, all of our production is going to be able to go up. I'm going to be able to get you guys more stuff. We're going to have more stuff and hopefully see where we can take this yeah. next adventure. You I know love what I mean? it. I have enjoyed meeting the Coyotes of the Month and just some of the managers, Jazz and New Orleans, yep. Brittany and Denver. Like it has just been a joy to like talk. And I feel like family. Some of these girls I have never met before. Right. Many of them I hadn't, but it's just been feeling like an absolute joy to be back with my Coyote family. That's awesome. And we love to have you back. Thank I you. I love that you have that history with all the, the people you're talking to. You know what I mean? This isn't just some hypothetical to you. You lived it. Yes. You put those boots on. Yes. You know what it's like <laughs> to have to, to sing into that mic, yes. to get a, a crowd all looking and paying attention to what you're saying. Yes. Right? Like yes. Those are skills that you don't get other places. That's so you know, true. Because we give, we give you guys tools that you don't get at other bars. You know what I mean? That microphone is a crazy tool that, that we utilize. Yeah. That, you know, is helps create the show atmosphere. You know what I mean? That's I love it because it gives everyone a little bit of their personality to what they're saying on the microphone. That's so true. When I worked at the Charlotte bar, I was actually in school at UNC Charlotte and getting my degree in communications. And it was then that I knew, yeah, this is, this is the way I want to go. I liked having that mic in my hand and, so that was perfect. That helped me yep. know that I was on the right path. So what was it like for you being able to travel the country? You're doing it by yourself at first, right? Yes. Because you don't really know your coworkers. And I imagine you get stuck in strange cities at times and you're getting in the cab and you're going to your hotel, right? Yep. Were you the type that went off and adventured a little bit or did you hide in your hotel? I mean, no, I've done both yeah, on my travels. So. Yeah, it just depended on the day. Sometimes, yeah. you know, after a full day of back and forth doing back and forth flights, I might just go back yeah. to the hotel or I'd venture out. 
I loved when we had a crew that was kind of interested in hanging out too. So we'd always go to like some good restaurant that was well known in the area and just kind of figure out the area. Would you say? Did you ever have to eat by yourself? Because I think that's like a unique experience on by yes. alone. Yes, and I love it. To be honest, I, yeah, it does not bother me. <laughs> me you know what else I used to feel weird about that because of traveling so much that it stopped bothering me is going to see a movie by myself. Yes, I was going to say the same thing. I enjoy both of those. I love it. People think it's weird. I love it. Whoa. It's nice. I don't have so, anybody talking to me, asking me questions, talking during yes. a movie. It's awesome. You don't have to entertain <laughs> yourself. You've got you've got a couple hours to kill. Here's a nice, fun way to do it. Yes. When I would do market research, that's exactly what I do because there's periods of time where I don't, like, I'm, I'm not too concerned about. I'm not mm-hmm. too concerned about the... The morning hours, because we don't do a lot of business during that. Mm-hmm. If it's a place that has opportunities to open at noon, like a San Antonio versus an Austin, mm-hmm. then I'd pay attention to that those noon hours. But if it's a place that I know we're opening at five and then going, anything up until five is kind of irrelevant. Yeah. You know what I mean, I need to know what happens from five to 2 a.m. That's <laughs> what I need to know. Yes. So what am I doing <laughs> that whole during time? <laughs> Right. There's a big block of time where I wake up at seven or eight in the morning and I'm like, okay, nothing to do till five. Right. So, so sometimes if I didn't have anything, I need, well, you know, virtual work became much bigger as the years transpired, but it was just a great tool for me, but it just takes some adjustment. It you know, does. I went to Germany and right after we opened the, the, the Austin bar, I went to Germany and I spent a month there nobody spoke English. Like I was kind of surprised that even the young people were very few and far between that spoke English. Mm-hmm. So I, if it weren't for the fact I came out of the Vegas market and had people that could kind of meet me in every one of these cities, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have talked to anyone for a month. I wouldn't have. Is that typical for <laughs> coyote market research? No. Being on a month? Not, no, not when it was a uh, particularly long. So I did a whole toured the country okay. and then shot over to Amsterdam at the end of it too, just to, to gauge it. Um, because at that time we had just started getting enough money where we could do a trip like that. Uh-huh. Um, and you wanted to maximize it as opposed to flying back and forth, flying back and forth. Cause that mm-hmm. just adds up to total. So mm-hmm. I basically took a train and bounced one week at a time in all these major cities, Frankfurt, Berlin, Hamburg, Dusseldorf, Amsterdam and there's one other city I went to as well. Um, oh, insane! <laughs> <laughs> it was insane. I went to Berlin. That was like midway through my trip. Mm-hmm. And being in Vegas, I I worked at that venue I was telling you about. Like mm-hmm. I had some high end, big profile events, and one of which was for Netscape at the time, mm-hmm. and. I just hit it off with the number 12 guy at Netscape when it launched. He was a tech guy that must have come to, I don't remember exactly how we met, but we just kept in touch. He was real early on. I was super early on, on the email blasting for, for bar industry. And he taught me what the hell BCC was, the blind carbon copy, Uh because I was sending my entire list out to people not knowing because this was like right in the beginning of that. There's no service that did it. You had to manually do it. Right. And from then on, we just kind of hit it off. Well, he was, he's, he's from Germany. He's German. And he was in Berlin and he met me and he took me around one night around Berlin. And I went to this big popular nightclub called Sage club. And they had a vampire party called the blood party. (laughs) And I walk in and I'm in Germany, this is week two, and I've already met a Nazi at this point, which you'll hear about on our other podcast, <laughs> Crazy crazy Burnout. Okay. But yes, met a Nazi my first night on this trip, and I'll have to tell you about that. You'll hear about that on the next one. Okay. But we're in Berlin, I'm walking in the doors, and there's this long corridor, and lining both sides of this corridor are pedestals with ice blocks on them. And as you're passing by, you're seeing that inside those ice blocks are pig's heads. Please and I'm like, do you oh. have pictures to insert right here? I do. <laughs> and, and then you go in to this main room. And in the main room, all the staff is wearing white leather. And they all have blood coming out of some 
eye, mouth, whatever. Mm -hmm. On stage as a DJ, flagged by two showers of raining blood onto two girls in all white latex. Um, they have vampire movies playing everywhere. The other room has two DJs on chain link flooring that you can see through. Mm -hmm. Head to head, suspended over uh, the dance floor area with bloody IV bags hanging everywhere. Oh, and at midnight, <laughs> they took a guy and put hooks into his back and suspended him in the middle of the dance floor. <laughs> and you're seeing all of it right now. And <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh! So, so yeah, it was a crazy trip, and and this I found is week two, two? week two, oh and I found two bars <laughs> operating illegally as Coyote Uglies. Oh two, God. two, by just walking by, like just happened to be walking by. I'm like, what? So yeah, that's a huge part of our business as well, enforcing our trademark, and we have some crazy stories involving that. Oh as well. man, I want to hear it about this next podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Our bar is very an Ameri a very much an American brand that even within our corporate structure are on both sides of the of the aisle. Mm -hmm. We're on both sides of the aisle. I, I file on both sides of the aisle mm -hmm. on different issues for different things. But in the end, like I want America to do great. Yeah. You know, I do. And I appreciate all my experiences and all the different types of people I've met doing this company. Absolutely. You know, from major cities on the coastal cities to all through the South. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I've enjoyed the experiences of being at the Ritz Carlton in, in Hong Kong and doing the beach parties with a, with a big campfire. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I love four wheeling in mud and I think that's fun. Camping is fun. And so is staying at five star resorts and having three star chefs cook you meals. Love right. It. All of those experiences are fun. They're just different in different ways. And mostly it's people making the best use of the opportunities around them, mm -hmm. right? In the end, we're all just trying to have as much fun as we can. That's it. For the limited time that we're here. And that's what I would love for the feeling to come back to. Like, I don't, I definitely don't agree with everybody in the country. Mm -hmm. And to me, we have to start where where we're just treating each other equally as close to the same starting line as possible so that we can just move forward together. Absolutely. Well said. You know? I'd vote that's, for you, that's Lee. What I hope for. Run for president. That's what I'd I hope. vote for you. <laughs> I, I have had people ask me about running for politics so many times, and I tell everybody the same thing. There is not a closet big enough for the amount of skeletons that I would need to hide in it to even be considered for running. Although oh. the current temperature, I bet that wouldn't even matter anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a club guy that came from Vegas. You spent a lot of yeah, time that... as a bachelor there. Yep. You know what I mean? Like those skeletons don't that matter. Presidential material. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely be the most inked up one though. <laughs> But you know what I mean? Like to me, like that's what I love about the bar industry is that it's we all get together in that universe where traditionally in the beginnings of our country, bars were separated by political ideologies. And you went to the bar of the party you supported and you would toast to these ideas together called they were they were called health, mm -hmm. toasting to each other's health. But they called them health, not toasts okay. back then. But it was toasting and, and giving health to these different ideas that you would shout back and forth. Now, I don't see that divide within the nightlife industry by political lines anymore. To me, it's like, for especially Coyote, you've got your lawyer next to your, your construction worker, next to your educator, next to your artist, next to your content creator or whatever else. Yeah. Like crazy job. AI prompt engineer. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's it's a little cross section of America. Yes, and, it is. And if we if we can just all share a pint together and and find the common ground again, I feel like we can move forward a lot faster and be prepared for what's coming yeah. because AI is going to change a lot of things. Three D printing is going to change a lot of things in the next twenty years. Wiping out 60 to 80% of all jobs. Ooh. Because what's the point of having shipping, manufacturing, warehousing, retail, if everything could be printed on a 3D printer at home 
for your next iPhone release, you're just downloading CAD drawings and you're printing it at home because that's where we're looking at in the next 20 years. And just that one piece of tech crazy. is going to wipe out all those industries we just discussed because you're also going to be able to print food. They're already printing food. They're printing houses. They're doing all of these things. What's with AI is our opportunity maybe to fund things like universal basic income, which you see a ton of CEOs talking about now. Something people like Elon Musk, Zuckerberg, Bezos are all talking about universal basic income because they know what's coming with automation. Mm -hmm. They know all of these jobs are going away. They know it. And I don't think everyone can be an engineer. Yeah. I don't think that there's enough engineer jobs out there. There's not enough of those jobs to make up for losing 80% of the workforce. We have to start getting together now because that change is coming whether we like it or not. We all got to get on the same page because there might be an opportunity. What if your life is about spending time with your family now? Mm -hmm. What if it's about having AI drive businesses and automate them to, end up to a point where everything is set it and forget it. I could do that right now with a merchandise company. I could have AI draw the designs. I can then have AI design my website. I can connect it to a fulfiller that would have it connect to each other. So anytime someone orders, it sends it to the print shop who then prints it, packages it, sends it to my customer. And I don't touch any aspect of that. The whole business runs on its own. And that's just one of thousands of businesses that will probably be able to be possible by using automation, right? So if we can do that and we can just, everyone can just make money <laughs> and survive and pursue whatever they want, whether it's locking themselves in the basement and playing video games yeah. or creating art or starting charities mm -hmm. or just enjoying life. Yeah. Like that's what's coming down the road. And if we can all get on the same page, Let's create a world that works for everybody. Right, right, right. This is the true moment of democratizing capitalism. Because mm -hmm. right now it's all con concentrated at the top. Yeah. Bezos and, and Musk have increased their net worth in the last 10, year, 10 years by something like a thousand percent. He went from having something like in the 40s, 50s mm -hmm. to hundreds of billions that's why so i enjoy talking if, to you lee you like you know it all you like, know so amazing. no i don't like but i love to learn i love right? it like, i love, I to love find it out. i love it so that's why you know that's what i love and yes i am definitely have a romantic view of what the nightlife <laughs> bar industry has there are downsides to it. You know what I mean? You're selling a destructive chemical, probably one of the most destructive chemicals on the planet. And that's something I do think about, mm -hmm. right? So what are the benefits though to this industry? And that's when I started looking at that. And, and I feel I, I'm not a big drinker. If you do things in moderation, I think it's great, but I definitely am a social drinker. And I do find that it is social lubrication <laughs> and that it can kind of drops down some Social walls and let's start talking dude i i can't tell you how many times i've gone from almost a fight to toasting with a guy by the end of the night and buying beers for each other oh. right by talking because you have to in this industry right where we don't really when i started this industry in security you did open people's doors with their face right mm -hmm. you would grab them and literally open the door <laughs> with their face throw them out the door to the point where the industry changed to where you're not even touching people, mm -hmm. right? And all centered around liability. And I remember when that happened, I remember that my entire security staff said, screw this, I'm not doing that anymore. And when a new crop came in and guess what? It actually, you don't need to open people's doors with their face yeah. to keep security. You don't, you don't, mm -hmm. you don't. So mm -hmm. the industry grew, the country can grow, we all can grow. And maybe we can do that over a pint and a shot, yeah. right? And that's what I'm hoping we can do with, with these channels and what you're doing, talking to the girls and, and to these different people that we will be discussing. We'll hopefully talk to some other CEOs with the, with the challenges and the strategies they use. Mm -hmm. And we're going to need your help in helping us find those people. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. You know, if we I'm end here. up talking five years from now and we have our own channel and TV, I would not be surprised. Oh.
That was my that dream was for cool. Coyote Ugly. But, oh, me too. Like, there's just a lot more to be said. There's so much. I wanted to ask no. you a question. You mentioned that you're a social drinker. As am I. Like, yes. I'm not really a big drinker. But I noticed, like, when you're a coyote, like, everybody's like, what? Everyone's got like, drink. <laughs> yep. You got to be willing to put them down, take shots all yep. the time. So so that some of that's true still and some of it isn't. Like, when Lil and I first started this adventure together, it was. Like, she was drinking Crown. I've never been more sick than I have been when I was with her in one of the early trips to Vegas that we had for meetings. and. um that has slowly shifted to great wines mm-hmm. and and less shots, <laughs> but still fun. Yeah. Right? It's just like you, you just kind of shift. For me, I don't care. I never think about having a drink when I get home. Mm-hmm. But I would it would it's weird to me to be standing out there socializing and not have a drink in my uh-huh. You know what I mean? I, I do enjoy it during those scenarios. So for me, it's about the environment, mm-hmm. right? It's not about the substance, about the environment and then the social interaction. I just enjoy sharing a drink with other people, mm-hmm. and especially from different walks of life from me. Yeah. I want to learn. Show me how you live. Yes. Right? Show me the things that you do that you love. And I think that that's, well, we'll circle back to the end of this, but I think that's what made America great to begin with. We basically said, send us your week, send us your downtrodden, Send us whoever you got, whoever is strong enough to come here, come here. And then we all came to this one country from all these different backgrounds and we started solving problems together, right? Started solving problems together. Well, you know what? Maybe the guy from India had a better solution to that problem than my friend from Ireland did. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, And we started the best ideas rose to the top. You know, we're better together in the, and, and, and all the different backgrounds makes you make better decisions. Harvard found that out. Diverse teams make better and faster decisions. Yep, absolutely. And I think that's why America shot from like this obscure little podunk country to the global leader that they are today. Mm-hmm. And and I'm of the, the camp that that thinks we can always get better. Yeah. It can always get better. No matter how good you think it is now, I know change is scary. And for a lot of people, just the fact that it's different is too much to bear. Mm-hmm. The devil you know is a lot less scary than this unknown of future that might be worse than what I've already got. Right. Mm-hmm. And I don't really think that that's how it works. I think that things change monumentally in painful, tiny, incremental steps. Mm-hmm. Right? tiny painful steps so i would just i just i'm tired of it i'm tired of the division i'm tired of it come let's do let's do some shots yeah let's, let's yeah a pint. Let, let's just relax in this other universe that we don't have to be in and see how we can make the outside of those four walls a little more like the inside yes. of the four walls i was right? gonna say i think that that is one of the things that i really loved about working at coyote like it was so diverse. I think sometimes people think that it's not very diverse, but it was it was pretty diverse. Oh, and sure. I grew up in a military background, so like living on military bases, and it reminded me of that. Like we were all family. We all like we would go out to eat after our shifts. Um, yep. Like really, just a f- big family from all different yep. walks of life, and probably yep. think politically on on you know different sides All but we were place. we yeah. were a family and i think that that made me feel like safe i knew uh, at yep. hooters i didn't feel that way but at coyote ugly i knew that i was safe and i was really with family yep, yep. yeah I, I totally can appreciate that because that feeling is important yeah right? and that's the feeling that you have to feel safe to get up there and put, put yourself <laughs> out there like that yeah. you have to you do because if you don't trust the people on your left and your right how are you ever going to be able to go up there and put yourself out there to all of those spaces staring back? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Cause that's what it's like. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. So I, I think that's really important. I think that is one of the part of the secret sauce behind the company mm-hmm. is, is that family you're safe. We've got your back kind of mentality. In every way definitely... too. Like you said, yeah. I'm from Charlotte and Atlanta bars, but like, 
family, you and Lil have been close to me since I've been yep. a Coyote. And even in the yep. years that I wasn't with the team, like I was still part of the Coyote family and I knew that. They always are. Yes. Yeah. Always yeah. are. Like, you know, it's like one of those things, like once you're a Marine, you're always a Marine. Mm -hmm. like you're, there's no ex-Marines. There's just former Marines. Yes. There's no ex-Coyotes. There's just former, former Coyotes. Coyotes. That's how yep. it is. Yeah. Yep. It's a That's story it that I would never change. Like that part of my life has been amazing. And like I said, being back with you all is just awesome. Because I'm excited for 2.0. Right. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, because that's what this is yep. now. Like, you got to see where you got with 1.0. Now let's see what happens with 2.0. Yes. Yep. Right? Exactly. That's what I'm looking forward to seeing what we, what, where this goes. Absolutely. Thank you again well, for the well, opportunity. I, yes. And I appreciate you taking the hour out of your day to, to have this crazy conversation with yes. me that went way differently <laughs> than I ever anticipated. It did, wow, but it was correction. great. It was great. Yes. Yeah. I'm super passionate about the things we talked about tonight. I love this company. I love what we've done. I'm so proud of the accomplishments that this small, small team has made. Yeah. People have this impression that we're this mega Walmart company yep. <laughs> with this big office and all this stuff, but really we're a handful of people. How many are in the and corporate team? Uh, four. Four? We've got Chantel. Uh -huh. We've got Tommy, Lizzie. I oh, don't know Tommy and Lizzie. Okay. Yeah. So is Jeff and so, Kevin considered part of the corporate team? Well, they're, they're C-suite, okay. so I, I would consider them in a different place there we're the partners okay. so there's four of us okay so jeff the attorney kevin's the hammer and nails guy mm -hmm. we call um design development so anything has to do with building out like his job's super important at the beginning phase especially mm -hmm. of, a, of any new project because he's the one that determines that we're not going to lose our ass on building this thing out okay right he has to make sure the the gcs are doing what they need to do he has to make sure the way we design it is conducive to our business model mm -hmm. and that we don't go so crazy that we can never make our money back right. kind of a thing. Right. Like this company is able to open so efficiently with money and have them start paying back so quickly, start becoming profitable so quickly because of that. You know, um, the, there was this thing I was uh, uh, consulting for called Kind Heaven mm -hmm. and it was for the Lollapalooza team. Um, and Perry Farrell, mm -hmm. who's the lead singer of Jane's Addiction. And the guy, the executive chef from the place that was Tao before Tao, hit me up in 2017. And they've got this huge 120,000 square foot venue they're rebuilding. They're building in the middle of the Las Vegas Strip. They're not. Just to break even for that project was going to be plus over $10 million a month. Oh, my God. Yes. So like that is how the other extreme it can go, mm -hmm. right? Like, so I've just, I've worked for both extremes and I'm just so impressed by how much we're able to do with the, the amount of money that we put into these and why they're so quick to start paying back. I, it's just, it's just been very fun to watch that play out I over bet. the last 20 years. I it's bet. Been, uh, the a big university I've done here with Lil, you know, I, I knew a lot of what I knew about, but this this level of business, uh, most bar operators aren't negotiating licensing deals for merchandise to sell into every major retailer in the country and have higher sell through rates and target that than Ford and John Deere, who have been their number one and number two seller for 20 years. That doesn't happen in a normal nightclub. <laughs> I'm not normally, I don't get to live a, a while on E like yeah. Brooke Burke's got to have, you <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? I remember watching that when it came out and I'm like, God, she's got the best job ever. Two years later, <laughs> I had that job. So I, I cannot tell you like, it, it was a risk and it paid off so beautifully. And I am forever thankful to my team oh. for for allowing me to be part of that adventure and then get to meet people like you along the way just has been the best experience of my life, my career and my life for oh, sure. That's great. It is, I am forever changed. Maybe not because I've been on the bar because I definitely, I mean, I have been on the bar, but <laughs> not like you guys. Um, but in, in, a, in other ways that I can definitely attribute back to working with Lil and our team for sure. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. 
This was great, Lee. All right, Courtney. This has been so much fun. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm glad we got a little more, know a little bit more about yes, you. Yes, thank uh, you. Your journey here. Um, tune in to Courtney on Instagram. You can find us at Coyote Ugly underscore the satellite bar. Yeah. Right. There you go. So that's where you can find us. You can see Courtney and all of her interviewing awesomeness, our illustrious coyote of the internet. Yes. And I am Lee Killingsworth, <laughs> Chief Marketing Officer for Coyote Ugly, signing off. This is Last Call. You don't have to go home, but you do got to leave. <laughs>